this light will go Housing. on. Okay. Housing. Good morning. I call this hearing to order. Good morning. I want to welcome all of you to this hearing of the Small Business Subcommittee on Health and Technology. It's an honor to chair this subcommittee, and I look forward to continuing the work we're doing to improve opportunities and growth for the nation's small businesses. Today, we'll be examining apps, which are applications of technology accessed on smartphones and other portable handheld devices. U.S. demand for mobile data grew by 63% in 2014 and is expected to increase sevenfold by 2019. Since, 20, oh, since 2007, the United States has seen more than 750,000 app economy jobs created. An astonishing 77% of the apps are made by startups or small companies, and nearly 80% of these companies are located outside of Silicon Valley. And this industry is steadily growing. Findings predict that the app economy will reach $151 billion by 2017. App technology provides businesses and consumers with fast, viable solutions to everyday problems. And research shows it is the entrepreneur, due to an ability to remain flexible in a quickly changing market environment, who is leading the development of these innovative apps. Developers are producing apps that integrate home automation systems, track and monitor health statistics, offer budget and financial transactions tools, and allow consumers to have their groceries purchased and delivered. The continued impact that the app industry will have on the United States economy are significant, and we must help foster that growth. In fact, more than 20 percent of all apps sold in China were developed by American businesses. This is a perfect illustration of the potential growth for the industry. I also want to touch on the implications app technology provides for underserved regions such as my district, American Samoa. Entrepreneurs in the farthest corners of America can tap into the app industry, and our residents are among the innovators. For instance, a Pango Pango native from my district developed a photo app that allows users to add Polynesian cultural filters and designs to their photos before sharing them. I want to thank the witnesses for being here today to help us examine and further understand the implications app technology can have on the economy. I now yield to the ranking member for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Radawagan, for holding this important hearing. Thank you also to our witnesses, especially Cassie Gray, a small business owner who traveled from Massachusetts to be here today. Creative entrepreneurs like Cassie make our economy stronger and we need their input to ensure the laws we make are working for everyday Americans. There is no question that technology has changed every facet of the American economy. Think about it. 
Only a few years ago, it would be hard to imagine how much we could accomplish from a device that fits comfortably in our pockets. This hearing comes at an appropriate time. Research shows that entrepreneurship among Americans is declining, an alarming trend. In her testimony, Ms. Gray describes the Etsy platform as a, quote, on-ramp to entrepreneurship. For our economy to truly improve, we need more on-ramps to entrepreneurship, and technology like mobile apps can help lead the way. Today, entrepreneurs are building entire business models around smartphone applications. New forms of commerce are emerging daily as the web becomes an increasingly mobile platform. Small business owners use social networks like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to market their products. Americans now use smartphones, tablets, and other handheld devices to do everything from ordering groceries to booking travel arrangements to sharing photos to monitoring their health and fitness. Our economy is stronger and more efficient as a result of these innovations. Not only are entrepreneurs developing innovative apps, but more traditional businesses are harnessing wireless technology to reach new markets and serve existing customers more efficiently. Nearly two-thirds of small businesses now say it would be difficult to continue operating without the use of wireless technology. Thirty percent of firms with fewer than 20 employees utilize mobile applications as part of their business model and small companies are saving 275 million employee hours a year through the innovative uses of wireless technology. As mobile web platforms become more integral to the American economy, Congress, the FCC, and other agencies will encounter a number of regulatory challenges that must be addressed. As Cassie will demonstrate in her testimony, one of the most basic challenges is ensuring widespread access to broadband. Today, the Federal Communications Commission reports that 95 percent of small firms have broadband connectivity. This constitutes important progress, but more work must be done. In particular, there remains a significant gap between rural areas like western Massachusetts and large cities. Ensuring universal broadband access is vital to promoting commerce. In that regard, programs like the Rural Utility Service and the Universal Service Fund will remain critical to economic development in traditionally underserved communities. This committee has an important role to play in ensuring that as those initiatives evolve and are reformed, the needs of small and micro businesses are kept in mind. Entrepreneurship and innovation are two traditions that have always made our country an economic leader. That remains the case today as small businesses are on the leading edge of developing new apps and utilizing them to expand their market share and find new efficiencies. As always, this committee has an important role to play in ensuring that policy changes in this area provide the appropriate degree of regulation and consumer protection while allowing the space for maximum amount of innovation and growth. Before I close my remarks, I want to take a moment to acknowledge another witness, Patty Green. Ms. Green is the Academic Director of the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program at Babson College in Massachusetts. This program has benefited small business owners throughout the country, throughout Massachusetts, and throughout the 6th District. And it is wonderful to have her with us here today. On that note, I would like to thank all of the witnesses for being here to share their valuable perspectives, and I yield back the balance of my time. I would like to take a moment to explain the timing lights for you. You will each have five minutes to deliver your testimony. The light will start out as green. When you have one minute remaining, the light will turn yellow. Finally, it will turn red at the end of your five minutes. I ask that you try to adhere to that time limit. Our first witness this morning is Morgan Reed, Executive Director at ACT, the App Association, where he specializes in application development issues. Mr. Reed has testified in both the House and Senate chambers and has authored several white papers on app development. He also serves on the Advisory Council of the Mobile Health Information Management System Society. Our next witness is Dr. Patricia Green. Dr. Green is the Paul T. Babson Chair in Entrepreneurial Studies at Babson College. Before joining Babson, she chaired entrepreneurial and leadership programs at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and Rutgers University. She is also a member of the National Advisory Board for the Small Business Administration's Small Business Development Center. 
Next, we have David Barrett, the founder of Expensify, a complete online expense management service. He started programming when he was six years old, and it has been his primary activity ever since, with a brief hiatus for project management, technical writing, and world travel. Finally, we have Ms. Cassie Gray, owner of Shop Clementine, an Etsy shop that she runs out of her home in Massachusetts. Ms. Gray creates minimalist jewelry using recycled silver, reclaimed gold, and gemstones and diamonds. What started as a hobby has developed into a nine-year-long career through online sales. Ms. Gray, thank you for being with us today. Mr. Reed, you have five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Chairwoman Radwagon, Ranking Member Moulton, and distinguished members of the committee, my name is Morgan Reed, and I am the Executive Director of ACT, the App Association. I thank you for holding this important hearing on the impact of the app industry and mobile innovation for small businesses. We represent more than 5,000 companies that create the apps used on smart devices around the globe. My goal today is to highlight the remarkable growth of the app industry and where it is headed. We have three key findings for the committee. First, app companies are succeeding in every region of the country, as you have all pointed out. Two, the growth of the app economy provides access to technology previously out of reach for many small business owners in rural and underserved communities. And three, here is where I am going to predict the future a little bit, um, the future of the app economy, including in your districts, will be in financial, enterprise, and in health. In 2008, the App Store launched with only 500 apps. In seven years, the number of apps now exceeds 4 million across several different platforms, and the app economy has emerged as a $120 billion marketplace. Our industry research has consistently found that more than three-quarters of the top grossing apps are made by small companies, and 80 percent are based in the U.S., and as you noted, 77 percent are based outside of Silicon Valley. And while we all love Silicon Valley, I think it is a very important thing, especially as we are sitting in this committee, to understand that spread and that capability that the app economy is producing. But, you know, those are just numbers, so let us get a little bit more specific. Uh, uh, Chairwoman, you have already mentioned um, it's, the app is called pa, um, Kavagram, and it is done by a, a gentleman, Sonny Stevenson. And he did it, as you pointed out, to spread Polynesian artwork, allowing you to edit photos, decorate them with designs and images. It really borrows from the Instagram theme, and it has really been a huge hit. Um, several NFL players, who, uh, NFL players have been using it and putting out some pretty amazing photos using the uh, app um, from, uh, from Sonny. Uh, Ranking Member Moulton, you have one of my favorite app companies in your district. It is called Playrific. With more than 50 employees, Playrific builds amazing kids' apps like Pink Chilies, the magical elephant game, which uh, lets you build puzzles, test your memory. Uh, they are doing just a great job in a really safe environment for kids. And uh, it is worth pointing out, 50 employees is a real, jo is a real job creator. Um, more importantly, Every single one of your districts has a bricks and mortar small business that is using mobile to manage their point of sale, to manage their expenses, to help with customer relations, and improve customer service in the field. Now, the future of that mobile app economy is not necessarily just in those apps in the store, but in the apps being used in your place of business. Uh, if you think of it this way, uh, your mobile device then becomes the place and the repository for all of your information on your customer, something called you know, customer relations management. It, it tells you when you last met with them, what was your sale. When you go into that meeting with a customer, you possess in your hands for the first time, what did they last buy? When did they last talk to you? All of that information that makes for a rich customer relations can be right in front of you on your mobile device. Your training documents, and as we say, most importantly, your sales material for that next big deal. Now we jump step to the next place in health. Um, right now, we, we all know about wearables. I think at least yep, three of the four of us have wearables on right now. Uh, and what we know, what we know about them is, is that uh, your wearable device collects amazing information. But the next step is your doctor is going to speak to you through an app, and they're going to be able to see in near real time the information off your wearable. And God forbid you're in an ambulance, the ambulance will be able to send information to the emergency room via an app called Airstrip, which is already in the market, to keep tabs on your vitals, to make sure your emergency room is ready the moment you land. Well, what makes these apps possible? There's some obvious stuff, the network, devices, storefronts, but I'd say the biggest element is trust. Cloud technology that provides remote data storage is the lifeblood of the mobile economy. 
It allows users to access and share from any location. And if trust is a key building block, then loss of trust is the destructive kryptonite. Small businesses must be able to protect the data of their customers whose trust they've worked so hard to earn. So strong encryption, something, by the way, OPM didn't have, is critical. We ask that you take seriously any government efforts to weaken security measures. Just as troubling, the Department of Justice is currently requiring American companies to break the law overseas, forcing them to give data stored on foreign nationals at data centers abroad without approval of the host country. We encourage you to support the LEADS Act, which would provide a clear legal framework for law enforcement agencies. And finally, while small businesses must have the ability to protect their intellectual property, they also need help pushing back on patent abusers. H.R. 9, the Innovation Act, restores trust by including strong measures to ensure transparency and patent ownership, clarify what is and is not infringement, and allow defendants to recover legal costs. I thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Now, Mr. Barrett. <clears throat> All right. Hello, everyone. I am going to be the least uh, slick speaker here. I have never done this before, but it is quite exciting. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, I am David Barrett, the founder and CEO of Expensify. We do expense reports that don't suck. It is a bold division, but we are improving the world one expense report at a time. So what I am going to talk about here is uh, probably highly overlapping, and so I am going to go more anecdotal here about the uh, rise of the app stores. And I would say, in my mind, the uh, app economy started with actually a little-known uh, phone called the Danger Hip Top. I think I was the only person who liked this phone. Um, it was the first phone to actually have its own integrated app store, meaning that you could actually download and expand the functionality of the phone itself. Uh, this phone launched in 2002. Uh, but the app economy didn't really typically take off until about 2008 when the uh, uh, iPhone app store uh, in, in, a, in that six years, nothing happened. And I think the important reason why nothing happened is because the hip top was, uh, didn't, wasn't backed by Apple and thus didn't have the power to convince uh, AT&T to allow applications to be installed on their phones. And so for about six lost years, we had the potential for an app economy that simply didn't happen. And I think that really drives home the importance of having uh, open access to uh, the technology, uh, the Internet, and the users in order to actually enable the technology of an app uh, store to, to work. Secondarily, I would say, in addition to the App Store, what makes this whole revolution possible is the sheer power of these phones. I mean, I think that uh, I am trying to think of ways to sort of summarize how powerful these phones are. So to give some examples, the first portable computer that I can think of would probably be the uh, Apollo Command Module, 1969. Uh, it had uh, about uh, 64 kilobytes of memory, 43 kilohertz of, uh, of processing speed. To put that into comparison, a single iPhone can process about 16,000 times more data, about 33,000 times more fast. So that is basically a single iPhone has more power than the entire Apollo mission combined. All of NASA at that time uh, could be powered by a single iPhone easily. Maybe more recent is 1997, uh, IBM had a computer called Deep Blue. It was the first computer to ever beat a world champion uh, in chess. Um, a single iPhone is about 10 times more powerful than that computer. And that was just 1997. Uh, or maybe a more recent uh, uh, IBM computer is Watson. In 2011, uh, it beat Jeopardy for the first time. And so uh, it's, it was hailed at the time as being the smartest AI ever created. It's about 25,000 or 2,500 iPhones, which means that about seven years, due to Moore's law, which means that basically computing power doubles every 18 months, in about three terms, every one of your constituents is going to have a phone in their pocket more powerful than today's smartest AI. And so that is pretty astonishing. I would say it is not totally accurate to say that, um, uh, that every sm smartphone is power as powerful as a supercomputer, but it is pretty darn close. And any policy you put in place today is probably going to be applied to supercomputers by the time it is actually out in the real world. And so how this sort of works as a real world example, Expensify, as I said, we work in the uh, ever so exciting field of expense report management. Uh, and what we do is we have an app where you take a picture of the receipt, and a, a technology called SmartScan will read the information off that receipt automatically without any typing involved, put it on the right expense report, submit it for you. And so I'd say in our world, the, the uh, availability of a telephone platform uh, with an integrated uh, SmartCam uh, can enable sort of this uh, scanning technology to bring extreme productivity to uh, small businesses that are doing mobile travel on the road. Uh, and so I would say, but uh, the app evolution is not going to sort of appear like HAL 1000. It is not going to sort of, uh, artificial intelligence is not going to sort of appear in sort of this personal form. It is going to first start off with applications highly optimized for certain problem domains like Expensify. Um, and so I think that uh, an exciting thing about this, as we're getting these more powerful automation platforms, they're not going to uh, appear typically like in the enterprise or in the factories and trickle down to the people. 
the exciting thing about this environment is because of the sheer affordability of this platform, it affects everyone all at once. The entire world is benefiting uh, from these sort of small business applications, uh, starting with the individuals and moving on up. And so this sort of bottom-up adoption uh, of this technology, I think, is really uh, a major change for how technology has historically been adopted. And so I'd say uh, maybe a final point. I've heard uh, rural broadband mentioned. I think that an amazing component of the uh, app technology is that it enables uh, rural areas to actually contribute to a global economy. I know that our smart scan technology employs about 150 uh, contract workers throughout actually rural Michigan, where we have one of our offices. And so unlike a typical Silicon Valley business, which is just based around uh, San Francisco, we actually employ a global workforce and bring jobs actually back from around the world to rural America. And so I think that the uh, 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 smartphone uh, technology allowed with sort of powered by this global uh, internet economy is bringing a uh, rural economy into the uh, global economy as well. And so I think that there's a, a wide variety of things to do, all sorts of information in my notes here. Uh, but most importantly is things are really great right now. And I would say the most important thing we should work on is let's not screw it up. <laughs> things are actually really awesome. We don't need a ton of help. Uh, I would say patent reform, immigration reform, uh, even tax reform, things could help. But by and large, the main thing is let's just keep the party going. So thank you so much. And now Dr. Green. Uh, thank you, Chairman Radewagen, uh, Ranking Member Moulton, members of the subcommittee, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. It really is an honor to be here today. I am going to base my testimony largely on that as an entrepreneurship educator, but also as the owner of a small business, a store in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. I am um, also very pleased with the topic of the hearing today, as much of the public discussion around entrepreneurship and technology is really driven on a very thin slice of actual businesses in the United States, those that use or sell technology. And I would like to focus today that we are also looking at the other side of the equation, how do small businesses use and benefit from technology. Um, if we consider that fewer than 10 percent of all the U.S. businesses have more than four employees, we are a country of micro-businesses. There are 25 million businesses that are fit into this territory of how do we actually learn again and use about this. The fact that apps can be helpful, I take as a given. The question is how. How do these small businesses get access to the, the apps? How do they learn about them? How do they integrate them into their actual operations so that they can be tools for productivity? For evidence, I am going to use a couple of different things. One is a piece of research that was done last year by AT&T with the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council and finding that 94 percent of the, the polled small businesses use smartphone technology, two-thirds of them are using mobile apps. They do save up to 150 hours each. However, and I think this is an important however, 73 percent of them are using them for social media and marketing. Only 18 percent of them are using them for point of sale, for those types of activities. And only 18 percent of them are currently using apps to improve their operations. There is a huge opportunity to work with our small businesses. The rest of my evidence I am really going to draw from the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Program. This is a half billion dollar initiative to help small businesses. We currently operate in 13 sites across the country and some of the territories. And we are working with businesses that do have at least four employees, so they are growth oriented companies. The companies today reflect over $3 billion in revenues. The important part about that is the diversity of the businesses and the diversity of the people. So for the businesses, no single industry represents more than 10 percent of the businesses in the program. The professional services is, is 34 percent. Everybody else is under 10 percent. And the business owners are important, too, in that thinking about who is actually using the technology tools. The median age in the 10,000 small businesses is 46 years old. The, the range goes from 22 to 75. And please remember that these are, by definition, growth-oriented businesses fairly split as to gender, with 46 percent of the businesses owned by women, and a very broad array of educational backgrounds, ranging from some high school, possibly a GED, to multiple graduate degrees. So when we are thinking about who is using apps and growing their businesses, we are looking at all kinds of people in all kinds of businesses. Within the program, we teach about technology in three different ways. The first one really is it is embedded into the curriculum. So we actually do have uh, teaching notes for our, for our teams to use as to how do they expand and learn about technology. We, we work with peer learning. 
So how do they actually learn from each other, which is a huge way to learn about apps. And we also have a tech clinic where we actually teach them not about the apps themselves, but about how do you identify what technology is available, how do you evaluate it, how do you know what to pay for it, and most importantly, how do I bring it back into my company and teach others how to use it. The app technology piece is really probably the most critical question in, there in the how to use it. So the pricing is rarely the big challenge. It really is about a fear of inappropriate adoption. If I bring it in, will it work? And what is the cost if it doesn't work for me to have to go back, as these businesses generally have a very slim margin for errors? The question of app is also related to how they train their employees. And within the, the 10,000 small businesses, we have got 86.4 percent of the business owners report that they are providing on-job training. And again, these are very small companies, with 62.6 percent using some version of online learning, again, another opportunity for apps in general. I would like to close with one short example, actually, from a woman in another Massachusetts, Victoria Amador of Tremendous Maids who basically learned about an app to organize for communication across her, her company from another person in the program. She reports that using, in this case she is talking about Google, Vap, app, Google Voice, saves her thousands of dollars. He recommended it to her when they met during the online portion, and therefore she becomes an example of using technology to enable working with others to learn about technology. Thank you very much. And now Ms. Gray. Good morning. My name is Cassie Gray, and I am the owner of Clementine, a handcrafted jewelry business. Thank you, Chairwoman Radwagon and Ranking Member Moulton, for the opportunity to testify. My road to entrepreneurship was anything but fast or predictable. I moved to New York after graduating from college and joined the publishing industry, working my way up from assistant to senior copywriter. But I developed something like a restless hand syndrome. I just wanted to make something tangible, and I found my way to beading and jewelry making in my spare time. About 10 years ago, my personal life was in flux, and I left New York to move back to my hometown of Ashfield, Massachusetts. In this rural hill town, I had to cobble together a living from whatever I could, freelance writing, waiting tables, and making my jewelry. I opened Shop Clementine on Etsy.com in January 2006. When I got my first sale, I literally jumped for joy. For the first few years, revenue was quite modest, but I'd fallen in love. While I was still working other jobs, I devoted myself to learning all I could about jewelry. I took a series of intensive metalsmithing courses, which gave me the confidence to expand my line and focus on attracting new customers. Through it all, Etsy has remained my main venue. The Etsy platform allows me to directly talk to my customers, making the shopping experience truly personal. Now I work 50 to 60 hours a week on my business, and yearly revenue is more than $130,000. While my, store in, my story in particular is particular to my personal circumstances, my experience is similar to other Etsy sellers. Just today, Etsy released a new report about U.S. Etsy sellers, which reveals that they are business owners in their own right, and the income they earn on Etsy through the website and mobile apps matters to their lives and the broader economy. Like me, most Etsy sellers are women, 86 percent. Many are parents with children at home, just under a fifth are low income, and 39 percent live in rural areas. Nearly half of all sellers had never sold their goods until they joined Etsy, demonstrating that Etsy focus, uh, functions as an on-ramp to entre entrepreneurship. And while some might be inclined to write our community off as hobbyists, income from these creative businesses matters. For 30 percent of Etsy sellers, their creative business is their sole occupation. For the rest, their creative business supplements other jobs contributing an average of 15 percent to total household income overall. The Internet and mobile technologies have opened up incredible new opportunities to people like me. To operate my shop, I use the website and two mobile apps Etsy offers. As of December 31, 2014, Etsy's mobile apps have been downloaded 21.8 million times. The sell on Etsy app is indispensable in my day-to-day -day routine. When I'm working at my jewelry bench, I check orders and communicate with customers via the app. If I go to make a hammered ring, but I can't remember what gauge the silver should be, I check the listing details via the app. If I get a message from Etsy alerting me that one of my items has been featured editorially, I can increase the quantity available so that item doesn't sell out. I also do most of my business's social media interaction via, web, via apps, Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter. 
Mobile app technology enhances how entrepreneurial Etsy sellers like me reach customers and make a living. And it's only the beginning. Already more than half of Etsy's traffic comes from mobile devices. The fact that I can use my phone at all to do these things is a bit of a miracle. However, we still have a long way to go to getting access to, to, to technology to those who need it. I live and work in Franklin County, which is the poorest county in Massachusetts. Most of Ashfield, where I live, is completely without cell phone reception. In my house, high on the hill, I get just one bar of 3G. There is no broadband or cable available, so I use a satellite to connect to the internet. It's slow, and it involves me having to go out in the middle of winter storms with a kayak paddle to whack the cum accumulated ice off the dish. This gap in accessibility harms entrepreneurship and business. Policymakers have an opportunity to support businesses like mine. In addition to expanding broadband to rural areas, lawmakers should focus on the, on the needs of the self-employed and micro-businesses. Most Etsy sellers work alone and face very different challenges from even a 10 or 5 person business. They are part of a growing trend towards self-employment in the U.S., which offers both new opportunities and new challenges. For example, new administrative burdens impact micro-businesses dramatically. The newly introduced Remote Transactions Parity Act would require all Etsy sellers, regardless of size, to collect and remit sales tax in every state. Proposals like this threaten to undermine businesses of one who simply don't have the time or resources to comply with such requirements. Overall, I believe that and mobile are creating incredible new opportunities for entrepreneurs around the country. I urge con Congress to enact policies that support independent, creative businesses, enabling the broader maker market to thrive. Thank you. I want to thank the panel for your testimony. And now I'll give myself five minutes to ask some questions. <clears throat> Mr. Reed, you note that there are three billion different apps on the Apple Store site. This is tremendous growth in just seven years. Do you expect the industry to continue growing exponentially, or do you believe it will taper off? Oh, I'm confident that it will continue to grow exponentially simply because uh, look at the number of devices that people have. This last year we reached a point where um, connected devices in the United States exceeds the population of the United States. Uh, one of the things to realize is that the next generation of cars will all be connected devices. You've heard of the whole connected car movement. Well, now every single car is going to come with its own series of applications and its own connection. So. There is no question that the explosion is going to happen. What I think is more exciting is, as much as I love cool games, and we have a ton of members making cool games, I think it is really the way that, they, that mobile devices are going to empower um, Ms. Gray and others are the place where that exponential growth is going to be the most significant. You mentioned that some small businesses are using apps for inventory tracking instead of expensive software programs. How do these apps compare in terms of the quality of features? and ease of use as compared to a program used on a desktop? Well, it is it's, uh, it's a great opportunity to, to sit here next to uh, Mr. Barrett, who is, in fact, one of those generating an application, as he said, that, that completely alters the paradigm. Um, that is what is so amazing. So, uh, as you know before, you would sit down at your desktop computer, you would have your stack of expenses, and you would sit there typing away. Well, with a, with a product like Expensify, I am going to be your salesman today, awesome. you literally take your phone, you click it, and it shows up. So the, the idea of how it changes, and I thought uh, Dr. Green, her point was exactly right. The fact that that is only still at somewhere you know, under 20 percent, that is this hockey stick growth that we are going to see. Because an app like his does not just uh, do better or cheaper than the desktop equivalent. It literally changes the paradigm by adding features like the ability to take a photograph, the ability to combine it together, and then move it to a desktop product that allows you to file your taxes, that allows you to, um, hopefully not uh, independent yeah. state sales tax right. in 7,000 districts, yeah. but that is where you really see that hockey stick growth. It is right there. It is from products like his and from what Dr. Green talked about and the way that Ms. Gray um, said that she would like to incorporate them in her practice. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Dr. Green, what do you consider to be the major hurdles to small businesses utilizing apps in a constructive manner to increase a small business's efficiency? I think there's two parts to that. The first is knowing what's out there. They do know about a lot of the social media, but especially in underserved 
areas, that I'm finding that they only know about a small slice of what's really possible. So just knowing what's actually possible. And then the second is being able to undertake what they do see as a risk of incorporating this, because they're afraid of getting it wrong. They don't have a lot of resources available to correct mistakes, and they think they may be doing okay as they go and not necessarily seeing the opportunity of what they could really accomplish with using these new kinds of tools. Mr. Barrett, could you please elaborate on the impact your business in particular has had on the state and local community at your location in Michigan? How did you choose this location? Sure. Well, uh, actually, I just flew up there, uh, flew from there yesterday, and uh, it's in rural Michigan in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by trees and um, one ski hill. Uh, it happened randomly. We had a contractor that we uh, uh, hired uh, remotely, and then we had a problem. We're like, hey, we need a guy to do this. And he's like, I know a guy. Uh, and then that became two people, then it became four, and then now it's like basically hundreds. Um, and so I would say we've brought uh, millions of dollars of economic activity to this tiny town. Uh, we're working with the uh, local government, with the, uh, the mayor and the city developers there. Uh, and so I would say we view uh, Ironwood, Michigan as a true partner in the business and a really critical sort of secret weapon that we employ uh, to compete aggressively with uh, our uh, Silicon Valley peers, but also the uh, enterprise incumbents. Dr. Green, in your testimony, you state that peer learning about technology tools for small businesses is critically important. What recommendations would you make to policymakers to encourage the use of these tools, specifically mobile technologies such as apps? I think that's a difficult one from a policy perspective on how do you drive peer learning. The part I would probably go to comes back to my experience working with the SBDCs and the SBA in making sure that there are arenas in those, those funded parts of the program where these kinds of programs can happen. Probably the most important part of that, though, is to make sure that anyone that teaches in any kind of program that is supported by the government actually does understand technology, is able to teach about technology, and age can't be an excuse. Mm -hmm. These programs are really for everyone. So no matter the age of the instructor or the student, there has to be an openness there to trying new things. Thank you. And now I yield to Ranking Member Moulton. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Ms. Gray, what can Congress do to help promote the development of apps for small business? Well, I would say the, the most important thing is, is to continue to, to keep that free and, and, and open, uh, to, to not put any barriers. Um, your work on the, um, on, on the net neutrality was really helpful. Um, I think that we need to, in order to you know, really tap into entrepreneurship and, and technology, and we need to keep a level playing field for everyone involved so that no single party or, or entity has a, an advantage. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Reed, would you like to add some comments? Sorry. One of the things that I think she mentioned that, that, that this committee of particular jurisdiction has some interesting efforts on, a very good story about figuring out how do you get mobile apps to be built. Uh, when we had our fly-in, we had a person come who had tried to reach out for an SBA small business loan. And he went through a process where he went to, uh, I think, 19 banks. Um, he's a great entrepreneur, incredibly successful. One of the banks said something that I thought was amazing. He said, you know what, you're a great guy. Uh, we know you'll be successful. If you were coming here to build a gas station, I'd write you a check. But because I don't know how, within the confines of the SBA, to properly fund your clearly likely to be successful mobile application, I can't give you the money. And that's, so that's great. while I completely agree with Mrs. Gray that barriers to entry are a huge part of it, the government has the ability to write a check. And when it says, I'll write a check for a gas station, but I won't write it for an app that will grow and employ 150 people, that's when I have a problem. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Barrett, I am a
former Expensify user myself when oh, I had excellent. a small business before running for, uh, for Congress. I uh, appreciate you certainly made uh, things a lot easier for us as we were <laughs> trying to get our company off the ground. Happy to help. Uh, you mentioned immigration reform. Uh, mm -hmm. I wonder if you could comment on that and what a difference it would make and why, why, it, why you feel it's important sure. uh, to the small business economy. Sure. I think there are sort of two aspects of immigration reform. One is that immigrants are historically much more likely to start businesses than uh, non-immigrants. Uh, I think 40 percent of the Fortune 500 has been founded by immigrants or children of immigrants. And so I think if we are trying to drive the uh, growth in the small business economy, the number thing, one thing we can do, uh, Trump's comments notwithstanding, is to encourage uh, legal immigration, uh, because legal, legal immigrants are the best and the brightest, and so we want to encourage this. Uh, secondarily, I would say uh, the truly best and the brightest are H-1B uh, visa holders. I mean, these are basically uh, the finest people that we can find around the world. I mean, if we are going to let anybody in, that would be the people that we should definitely emphasize. And I know that um, as a small business, uh, we uh, compete uh, very aggressively with, again, our peers and our incumbents. Um, and the number one tool that we have in doing that is hiring. And so I think that hiring is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, rural Michigan for us is really key because we find the right people for the right um, position. Uh, but also we search around the world for the best people. And so I think that uh, uh, improving or raising the cap on H-1Bs can help uh, not just Silicon Valley, but I think many businesses compete more aggressively. Uh, in addition to just increasing immigration overall, um, I think will drive more small business growth. Great. Thank you. And Dr. Green, would you uh, be willing to add to that and offer your own perspective on the value of immigration reform or the, uh, whether it is valuable or not, frankly, to, uh, to small businesses? Mr. Barrick covered that quite well. I'm, there's two ways to look at that in entrepreneurship, too. There's a long history of certain immigrant groups also being very strong in creating businesses, not all immigrant groups, but certainly quite a few of them. So not only for the, the best and the brightest coming in, and I think there's a lot of best and brightest here, too, that they can all work together with, but also looking at who is going to start and grow the next round of new businesses comes into play as well. The woman that I mentioned from Massachusetts as an example of using apps actually is an immigrant to the United States and has received several awards as an immigrant-owned business. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all very much for appearing before the committee and for testifying. Uh, I certainly have learned a lot, and I yield the balance of my time. I want to thank all of the witnesses for taking time away from their businesses and families to participate in today's hearing. I now ask unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record. Without objection, so ordered. This hearing is now adjourned.